Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Park Report podcast interview. This is Roy. Hope you guys are doing okay out there. My guest on this episode is legendary drummer Simon Phillips, who has a new album out with Derek Sherinian called Sherinian Phillips Live. It's out now. Uh, we speak about his long career, working with Derek, a number of his other projects, and a whole lot more. But before I get to the interview, just a reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel, listen to us wherever you get your podcasts, visit progreport.com or on all our socials. And now my interview with Simon Phillips. Great to, to speak with you on here. I, I can't believe you're somebody we've never had on, on the podcast. Um, so it's a real honor. I mean, your career is legendary. You've, you've worked with everybody. I, 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 where to even begin to cover uh, what to talk to you about? But I want to start at the current thing, which is um, the Sheridan Phillips live album, which is coming out. Well, which is out, just came out. Yeah. And um, it's a, a live performance that you guys filmed uh, in on one show in California last year, I believe. Yeah. Um, talk about that a little bit. What came into putting that show together and, and everything that went into it, the response from the crowd seemed to be amazing. And I mean, the, the audio of it is fantastic. Ooh, well, that's, <laughs> that's luck. Um, well, you know, as you, as you know, um, uh, Derek and I have been working together for the last 20, 21 years or something like that. Yeah. But we've never had a chance to actually play any of the material live or in front of an audience. Um, mainly because, you know, he was busy doing his thing. I was busy doing my thing. And uh, an opportunity didn't come up until last year when he was asked uh, by um, Garrick Israelian to appear at the Starmus Festival in Yerevan, Armenia. Uh, the Starmus Festival is a most fascinating project. It's uh, it's basically the meeting of astrophysicists and music. And it's amazing how many of these astrophysicists are actually kind of amateur musicians. Uh, you know, I met this, this guy who's actually the czar of Mars, <laughs> Scott Hubbard. He designed the whole, you know, landing of the two rovers, uh, Opportunity and Spirit. Um and uh, he's a blues guitarist. He's got a band. Fantastic. And uh, we were at dinner and he, you know, introduced himself. And of course, and absolutely fascinating to talk to, to him and, and all the other amazing, you know, scientists uh, on, the, on, the, on the gig. But anyway, so Derek then called me. He said, hey, I've been asked to do this. Do you fancy coming to Yerevan and we could put something together? And I went, hey, that would be great. So it gave us the opportunity to put a band together and play some of the material that we've written over the last 21 years. And um, so we were discussing it and I said, well, rehearsing is fine, but you know, there's no more rehearsal than a live gig. Let's put together a warm up show. And um, we picked a place, you know, just it's a, it's a jazz club basically in Ventura. Mm -hmm. um, but they have, uh, it's very well organized down there, and they have uh, the possibility of recording wh whatever show they have there. So um, we put our heads together, we put a set list together, we put a band together, and we went into rehearsals, primarily for Yerevan, really. Mm. And we played a warm-up gig. And I, I said, well, look, let's do two sets exactly the same, because when you're doing a live recording, you always try, have to try to go for two sets because, you know, we're humans. Know. We, we yeah. make mistakes, and especially new a new band, that kind of music is very just tricky. You know, it's tricky music, and the only way it works is when you're on the road for two or three weeks playing every night. Then the band starts to sound like a band. But you know, when you first play, it, it's challenging because it, it it just doesn't. You know, you don't gel yet. Um, Everybody's too busy thinking what comes next, what comes next, you know. Oh shit, that chord, you know, and oh that melody, right? Who's the solo? Who's soloing? You know, it's right. It's uh, it's a lot, you know. <clears throat> so that's what we did, and um, <clears throat> we were pretty lucky. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I mean, I've done this many times, and what I have to be careful of is as I'm playing the show, not to think, oh, I got to fix that then. Uh, and oh, I know I'm going to need to do that, I, you know, because I'm thinking already about the recording, right? And it, 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 you got to not think about it. You've just got to forget it, you know. Uh, otherwise, you'll you'll end up making a mistake because you're not in the moment. You're 
kind of lagging behind the the the, the show a little bit. Um, but we were lucky, and we went to Yerevan, and um, uh, we we played there. It was a much shorter set, so it was a, it was over too quickly, really. But it was fun. Um, we got some really good footage from it, um, and that was it. And then we set about. Uh, I listened to both sets, picked the bits I wanted, and uh, usually I edit between in the same song. I'll edit between the two shows. You know, if the tempos are good, it's it's fine. Um, and then mixed it. And luckily, it um, it came out quite well uh, sonically. Li live recording is all, always a bit of a perhaps you you know you never know how the quality. It's not like recording, you know. But I think it came out pretty well. I was uh, really really happy with it. You know. Yeah. No, it sounds amazing. Um, and even with all, only being, let's say, you used part of the second show. I mean, that's still really really quickly put together and uh you wouldn't you wouldn't know it i mean well you guys have played with bumblefoot he features on all the records and also uh, rick Ferbacci's uh, uh on bass on that talk about working with those guys as well well actually i'd never played with uh uh bumblefoot before because uh, he would overdub his parts right um uh in fact i'd never even met him <laughs> oh yeah i had <laughs> really? I, meet him. I, I met him at a sons of apollo gig in france somewhere to lose i think it was right years ago um but we'd never played yet uh rick and i have only played a couple of times uh rick came and played on one tune on the last album that we did vortex um uh so we didn't really you know we haven't had a lot of experience and uh of course, Derek and I have never really played live together either. Oh, yeah. You know, so it's a very, very new band. Um, but, you know, everybody did their homework. They learned the songs. And the first rehearsal was uh, loud. Um, I had to kind of start, okay, guys, we need to turn down a little bit because we're playing a small club and we're trying to record it. That's going to be a problem. Um, and, um, yeah, we, we just started rehearsing and uh, it kind of clicked pretty quickly because they're all great players yeah um, but again you know like i said you 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 cannot i always say it takes a whole tour for a new band to really get in the pocket to to learn about each other the second tour is always better in terms of that um it just takes a while you can't um you you know a band that's been together 30 40 years has this wonderful thing of they just they sit down they play or they stand and they get on stage they play and immediately it has a thing a thing of years of playing to to with each other you know it was the same with toto uh, when i was there you know 21 years we would just sit down and play and it just had this groove it had that whatever it was you know um and you it it's time you know, you've got to invest the time. So uh, it's quite a challenge to do that to a brand new band and, and record it. Do you think uh, it's a show that you guys could do a few more, uh, you know, take it on the road and do a few more shows? Oh, it sounds absolutely. Like yes, we could. Uh, but then, you know, it's the, the, it's the, the, it's the fiscal problem. It's right. very expensive to tour. Uh, also, the other thing is with promoters, it, you, we're not a proven act. Any new act going out on the road is always it, it, it's a struggle to get the right and amount and a right amount of shows to make it work. Um, and also the, the the other thing is not only do I have a large drum kit, Derek has a large keyboard set up. So most of the clubs that we would I would normally play, let's say with protocol, uh, it, it's hard to fit on that stage. So it's true. I saw you with protocol at uh down in Boca in Florida. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the funky biscuit yeah. it's, it's called. Oh, I mean that's, that's, that's a tight stage. stage. Yeah. Very tight. Yeah. I mean, and it's you know, it's a bit of a drag trying to fit uh you know, so close together, trying to fit on a stage and make it sound good. But the thing is the audience love that. They love it when it when they're really close. Oh yeah. So yeah, it's amazing. You know, you got to just kind of take it uh, as it comes and go, well, uh, I'm sure they'll love it and, uh, you know, and we'll be fine, you know. Yeah. So that's that's the challenge, putting together a, a live touring band with Derek uh, to make it work. But again, you know, we, we've had a few inquiries from promoters in Europe. Um, 
I think if we can get enough of that and put together a tour, then we'll definitely do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it would work. Um, you know, you and Derek have worked together, like you said, over 20 years. Uh, recently got back to doing a few records, uh, the, the Phoenix and Vortex, uh, or the last couple of years in a live album. Uh, what is it that works with Derek, with you and him, that, that seems to fit so well? And uh, what's the writing process with you guys? Is it through jamming? Is it through an idea Derek brings or you bring? Or how, how does stuff come together? Um, various ways. Um, we've always had a really good chemistry writing-wise. And after that long break, since we made the, I can't remember what that, that the last album was even, uh, Oceana maybe, or was there one after that? Yeah. I don't remember. Then there was kind of a long period where we didn't uh, do anything. And in 2018, he called me up and he said, I'm going to do another solo album. You want to get together and write? I went, OK, let's see. And uh, I was kind of curious to see if we still had that chemistry. And he came up, I made him a cappuccino and switched the studio on. And, and he said, well, I've got this thing here. And, and it was amazing. By the end of the first day, we had you know our first tune. So we've always had this, this writing um, chemistry. Um, we don't jam. We just come uh, with, um, I, I either have an idea, he either has an idea, and then immediately um, uh, I'll come up with maybe another section. It's usually all keyboard writing, because I write on keyboards. And uh, the difference is he can actually play them, I just own them. <laughs> um, but but um, you'll you'll play him a like an actual like piano bit or something like that and then and then he will take that and elaborate on it that type of thing absolutely yeah yeah i'll i'll uh i i mean i i might come up with some some changes i might even come up with just a melody or maybe a riff it, it can start very simple i'll just get a bass sound and go or a guitar type sound and go check this out and i'll figure out the notes oh yeah that one and then, and he's very patient. He, he lets me, you know, take my time and figure out where it is. And and then he, and then he'll go, oh, uh, hey, why don't you change that to a B flat and that to a, a G and that to a? And I went, right. oh, yeah, that's kind of cool because you know he has the the keyboard and the musical knowledge to do that just by hearing it, you know. Um, and it, I don't know how we do it. It it just it comes together. It's great you know? how it happens. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, what's cool about the last few records, especially, is the diversity of styles. I mean, there's sort of the signature kind of Derek rocker sound, right, on some of the tracks. Yeah. But then, one of the one of the tracks that I think really stood out on the last record was was that track Scorpion, right, where it's sort of a piano trio type thing. Yeah. Um, which which style do you do you like to do more? Is it the kind of the jazzy thing or the rock thing, or because I could see you guys doing a full album of just that, which would be amazing too, right? So we're actually we're planning it we are planning an acoustic album so he came up with an idea on the phoenix for doing a, 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 a well it started on the piano that's where he started we didn't realize at that time that we were going to do it trio style uh i'd been playing with hiromi uh, the trio project with Anthony Jackson. So I'd had quite a lot of experience of playing in a piano trio, playing quite progressive music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when you put a, an acoustic piano and a bass and, and a drummer together, you, you kind of think of it as going to be trio jazz straight ahead, you know, but it doesn't have to be. And with Hiromi, we were doing prog, really prog rock or prog jazz, let's say, um, acoustically. And so... Derek had this part, it was a, this song called Dragonfly, and I came up with some other parts, um, which I thought would be very challenging for him to play, but, you know, kind of fun to play. And then I think one day I just said, we, we should just do this as a, as a piano trio. And so we recorded Dragonfly, um, and the record company loved it, and immediately uh, said, why don't you do an acoustic uh, piano album? So scorpion is the next kind of song that we did right. and then for yerevan we actually did a set which was four um uh piano pieces uh dragonfly scorpion we did a acoustic version of uh aurora australis mm -hmm. so we just kind of edited all the bits together and just played it just piano bass and drums 
And then uh, we wrote another piece, um, which we performed, and that hasn't been recorded yet. So, yeah, that's a lot of people seem to, to like that. And, of course, Dragonfly went pretty viral on uh, YouTube with people trying to copy it and play it, you know, right. with people in India playing it. It was great. So, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it could definitely be um, an album. We've just got to write the, the material. And um, and yeah, Derek's got to play it. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have to talk about some of the other projects and bands and uh, you've been in. I was looking online at your discography and it looks like the count was about 97 albums that you've been on in some form. Is that even close to a correct number? Do you have any idea? No, no, it's hundreds. Yeah. <laughs> I... I... I don't even know. I mean, I have a discography that actually uh, a fan of mine put together a few years ago. Um, but it's in the hundreds. Yeah, yeah. I would There's think so, yeah. Four, I don't know, four or five hundred uh, albums probably, or or recordings. I mean, you, you know, I, I when you count a discography, you've got to say, well, I played on so many albums because it could be one track on an right. album. You know, you just never know. You know, Tears for Fears, I played on one track on, uh, um, oh, What's the name of that album? Uh, Seeds of Love? See, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and a few other albums where I might just appear, like The Cause, I did one track on on their record. Did you? Which album was that? I think it was their first one. Oh, okay. It was a song called Toss the Feathers. Yeah, that's a great yeah. album. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> I like that one. There's some video of that, too. There was a guy in the control room, and I never knew who was vid videoing, and I saw this years later on YouTube. I said... Shit, somebody recorded this. That's a or filmed it rather. Yeah. Video, you know? I have, uh, you know, your name appears over the years on a bunch of different albums that I have. And I, and it's funny, I, one, of, one of my favorite artists is Nick Kershaw. And you played on one song on, uh, well, on a oh, couple yeah. of albums of his. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I and I remember that your name going, oh, hey, here he is again. <laughs> so yeah. I yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's very cool. But uh, were there any projects? Well, maybe the chorus sounds like one. I was going to ask if, if there's been a project that, came kind of unexpected something you might not have thought of doing you know but that oh, turned out to be you know like a, a favorite or something interesting that that surprised um, you i think actually probably the biggest of that uh, uh was the Hiromi project i mean i got a call um that was that was really interesting because uh i was mixing a toto live concert which we actually scrapped because unfortunately the, the people that filmed it uh, overexposed all their cameras <laughs> and it was just horrible. And Ni Nigel Dick was trying to edit it, but he said, this is guys, this is not happening. This is not going to make a good video. And I was kind of halfway through mixing and we were doing a few fixes and stuff. And somebody had sent me a link to a YouTube video and it was Chick Career and this young uh, um, female Japanese piano player called Hiromi and they were playing together interlock pianos and it was really quite stunning I was like wow she's amazing you know and then um, we were doing some keyboard stuff um, for the Toto album and David Page and Steve Picaro came over and we did some fixes because there was some synth issues and you know stuff goes wrong in live recordings and you have yeah. to fix it you know um and at the end of the session i said all right i gotta play you something and i played them that youtube and they're both standing there with their jaws like you know on the floor who's that and i said well that's that's a a young japanese pianist called hiromi uh, so um and i think it was the next day literally the next day i'm mixing and i go oh, I need to go somewhere. I, I had an appointment or something. So I switched everything off, got in the car, and started driving to the appointment, and the phone goes. And it's Hiromi's manager. Huh. And her first question was, do you know who Hiromi is? And I said, yeah, I've just been watching her on YouTube, literally, like, you know. And she said, well, she would like you to play on her next album with Anthony Jackson. I went, oh, uh, wow. Um, well, Anthony, I know, I've known for years, but you do want, you do realize what I do. I play like rock and roll. I play a big, large drum kit and I'm very loud. And, you know, I said, oh, yes, yes, she knows exactly. In fact, she did 
you were at uh, Tokyo Jazz Festival with Toto, and that's where you met her. And I went, oh, wow. And I'd forgotten that. I didn't, I didn't know, you know. So that was, came, was the most surprising of any project because, first of all, the music was ridiculously difficult. Right. It really was. I mean, Auntie, Auntie and I are scuffling through these charts. <laughs> wow. Okay. You know, and um, we recorded our first album and then we started going out on the road and six years we did. And it was absolutely amazing. She's just incredible. And we did, oh, we did, I think we did four albums and uh, loads of gigs all over the world. It was great. That is very cool. Um you got back into uh, metal, uh, sort of, with uh, Kings of Mercia uh, last year with Jim Mateo uh, and his band. Yeah, uh, that was a great record. Um, talk about working on that one a little bit. Again, was that was that one of those things where you would you were sent the tracks and and it, it kind of online, right? Because I don't think you Again, got a chance to get together. Yeah, it's like uh, it's it's like a lot of uh, you know. I mean, back in the seventies and the eighties we would always turn up to a studio because there was no yeah. other way of doing it. And you get a call, would you play on stuff? So, yeah, great. You know, and often you wouldn't even get demos. I mean, you just turn up and here's the song. It goes like this. Let's play, you know, like the Judas Priest album, Sin After Sin, no demos. Um, um, uh, 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 um, Tipton. Um, okay. uh, Glenn. What's his name? Glenn. Uh, the good Glenn, thank you. Sorry, I just had a, a blank there. Uh, yes, Glenn. I mean, he he would play the first part of the song. Goes like this. We all joined in, and then the next part goes like this, and eventually we learned the song that way. Yeah. Um. So that's how we used to do it. But of course, nowadays, um, you know, people uh, just send an email, usually, and uh, you know, my name's so and so. Uh, I'm doing a record. Would love you to play on it, and. We go back and forth a little bit, and uh, then they start uploading tracks. I download them, and I record them. Yeah. That's 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 how it. How, the majority of album making now is is that basically. Is that easier for you nowadays, or you know, or it makes it faster to go through some projects, or 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 do 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 you miss the the interaction and having? Well, yeah, of course. I really so when I my productions, I always try to do them live. I always try to put a, a band together, and and actually we can play in the studio because it's quicker. In the end, it's actually quicker, and you can change things on the fly. Right. One of the problems with um, doing playing to tracks that have already been created is the tempo is not always right. And uh, uh, a sequencer will play at any tempo, everything perfectly, but that's not playing. Right. And often I find myself going, this is not the groove. This is not working. This song needs to be two or three BPM faster. Mm -hmm. And that's a bigger I issue for me. And, but I can't do anything about it. Right. Other thing is sometimes the arrangements there's like, hmm, it would have been great if we could have gone here. And you know what I mean? So sometimes the transitions don't work because it's one person working on their own, putting together these songs without any interaction from other people. So uh, that's where I feel that it, it loses out, you know. Um, but again, that's just my perspective. Um maybe other people are fine with it now sometimes i have taken it upon myself to actually do make to make fixes to make changes because it's just dr driven me mad <laughs> especially if it's a fairly complex music right. the straight ahead like like uh, kings of mercy that that's a it's it's straight you know and it's it's rock and roll and and it, it is what it is but some of the more complex stuff i get which is more fusiony uh there's just stuff which is like that's just uncomfortable to play and I'll go in there and I'll edit it and I'll record it and I'll send it. I hope you don't mind, but I I had to make a fix. I just couldn't bear to play this the way it was. And, you know, the the response is always, you know, that's great. It sounds so much better. Or uh, I, I was always wondering what to do with that bit. I couldn't quite figure it out. And it just sometimes needs someone else. You know? Right. Yeah. And, makes sense. And I, as I, I produce, you know, that that's what you do as a producer. You, you listen to the song, you go, all right, 
that section there is superfluous. It doesn't have anything to do to this track. It, it really doesn't belong in this song. Let's take that out. And they go, oh, wow. And then suddenly the, the track, the, the song flows, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's called arranging. That's really what it is. And that's what I, I mean. I think that's important is, a, is everything, right? You can't just take music and that's it nothing's ever done to it yeah. you know and it, yeah i mean your experience obviously the, I, I would imagine you absolutely know what you're doing uh i want to ask you quickly about a uh, protocol um you know you released a uh, protocol five uh with 2022 i think yep. um what's going on yep. with that band yep. now are you guys playing shows again or or what's what's the latest we we are yes we're we're, we're not doing that much this year we went to europe uh, had a great tour over there. We went to Japan, had a great tour there, and we've done some U.S. shows. Um, but for some reason, I think after COVID, uh, especially in Europe, it's been quite difficult to put shows together, basically because everybody is touring right now after, you know, two sure. years of not doing a thing. And, and so it's a little difficult, um, and people are still recovering, um, audiences, uh, tech, people that used to work at clubs of course they went and got other jobs so it's a little bit tricky and also with the, the war going on there's it's very expensive uh touring you know gas prices truck rental hotels flights it's, it's ridiculous so we thought okay let's sit this this year out next year we've got big plans we've got uh europe uh, european tour uh another japanese tour uh, and some U.S. dates, and of course, cruise to the edge. So yeah, we're still basically we're still promoting Protocol Five. I haven't had time to write the new one, so you know, right. that's it. I have to ask you uh, quickly also about uh, the Los Lobotomies record from way back, because uh, every time oh, on yeah. cruise to the edge, I do this jam band thing, late night live, it's called, and and uh, where uh, a bunch of the people that are on the ship, like the cruisers, get to go on and play some of these songs after hours and. And uh, sometimes right. other musicians on the ship will join them. It's kind of a fun event. But one of the songs that always oh. pops up is uh, Party in Simon's Pants, which is just, so, I don't know, it's become sort of this legendary kind of song, uh, uh, one of the things you've done. Really? Um, yeah, so it's, it's always played at one of these gigs. And it's just one I remember. You and mean I they actually it. try to play it? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, and yeah. and I always I always remember that album from a long time ago. Um, do you, do you remember working on that record and and any any stories from that time? Oh yeah. Oh absolutely. Well, that was the first time that Steve Lukather and I wrote together. I had just moved to Los Angeles, and I had a very basic setup. As a, you know, I had a studio in England, but I couldn't bring everything over. And um, he said, "Hey, uh, sorry, let's let's get together and write a write a song for the album." I went, "Oh, okay, great." So he turns up in my apartment in Studio City and uh, he, he comes in, he goes, uh, I've got my, uh, what was it? Uh, Zoom box, I think it is. Um, oh, God, what was it called? Um, Rockman, the Rockman, oh, right. like Tom yeah. Schultz yeah, Rockman. Yeah. And, but he said, but it's not working. I think I broke the, 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 uh, the power supply. And I took a look at it and I went, and um, I didn't have any of my tools yet, you know, because I'd, I'd have a work. Well, uh, you know, I have a whole workstation there and as I do a lot of that wiring and stuff, hmm. I didn't have anything. So I had to kind of get the, you know, some scissors, a kitchen knife and, and some PVC tape and put it, I could see what had happened though. It had frayed and the, you know, so I kind of spliced it together the best I could and plugged it in. It worked. Wow. And uh, I had already written the, the beginning of uh, the basic riff of uh, party in Simon's pants, which was in, uh, 17 i think 17 17 8. that's what yeah I, that's what i, I think it's 17 yeah. yeah yeah and uh and i played it to luke he said oh that's great and he learned it do, 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 you know like this he said and he just immediately went into the next section just just, just like that how about this so i put it into the into my little sequencer which is a at the time a qx3 i think the yamaha pop that in and then a couple of things and within an hour he was out the door and it was written <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so yeah, and uh, that was that was kind of my first uh, album that I recorded in uh, when I moved to Los Angeles at Capitol wow. Studios. Yeah. It was really, it was great. It was a big milestone, you know. Very cool. That's awesome. Well, Simon, thank you so much for taking some time, man. A pleasure to talk to you. Really exciting. Again, the Sherinian Phillips live album is out now. Please go get it. 
Uh, it's getting amazing reviews. It's, it's a phenomenal live record. And if you like that also, check out Vortex and the Phoenix, which came out recently as well. Great records. And, uh, and we'll see you on Cruise to the Edge. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, come and say hello. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll do. That'd be great. All right, All right. Have a good day. Good to talk to you. Bye. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on all our socials and on progreport.com for all your news, interviews, reviews, and more. And we'll see you again real soon.